we're live. All right. Good morning. This is Senate Health and Welfare. It is February 26th. And this morning we will um, we'll be talking about the Parent Child Center bill that's been introduced. And uh, also um, we'll be then looking at <clears throat> a report that's come back to us on provider reimbursement from the Green Mountain Care Board. Before we go uh, to either of those topics, uh, Josh, I understand, Senator Terenzini, you have a proposal of amendment to S48. And I don't know, have you sent that out to everyone on the committee? Or have you had time to do that? Okay, I haven't checked my email. I, I, I did, thank you, <clears throat> Senator Lyons. And I'm also about to send out um, the documents that I was sent that um, motivated me to uh, submit this um, amendment and uh so make sure i get everyone on the committee here yep and so uh last night i i i try my best to um update uh my constituents via social media of the the happenings of the day and really what i thought was a cel celebration for all of us was this nurse compact bill getting a initial passage yesterday was met with some um resistance from uh, some registered nurses that I'm uh, friendly with, and I was surprised to have learned of this. Um, and their um, frustration with the bill, they admit that we need more nurses, but their frustration is that um, their understanding is that their license renewal uh, to practice as nurses in Vermont, will the cost will be going up, up to $100 uh, per renewal to offset the cost of um the lost revenue that the Office of Professional Regulation is going to feel uh, if this nurse compact bill uh, is signed into law by the governor. And so it really didn't settle well with me. Uh, I had a conversation with you last night, Senator Lyons and others. Uh, I appreciate Senator Hardy's comments, uh, but I feel strongly enough that we should add language, which my amendment offers that says that uh, basically um, the um, the Office of Professional Regulation shall not increase the license renewal fee for a Vermont single state nurse license to recover any revenue the Office of Professional Regulation loses or anticipates losing as a result of Vermont's adoption of the nurse licensure compact. Look, at the end of the day, to me, it's very simple, especially over the last year. The, our nurses, uh, thank God for them, because where would we be without our nurses with this pandemic and, and everything else? And I think it's it's sort of a slap in the face to all registered nurses in Vermont that um, the Office of Professional Regulation would attempt to recoup some of their costs by increasing the fees for our dedicated nurses. And uh, it really didn't settle well with me. So that's why I've offered up this amendment and I would ask for your support as a committee. Okay, thank you, Josh, for that and for the explanation. And, and you did get, um, you did get a little, uh, a table or graph, a chart uh, uh, with uh, that came from some report. I forgot which report that was. Um, that indicated. This was a. Go ahead. This was from a 2019. Yeah. This was uh, documents from the last time before I was a senator. The last time the Senate passed this, um, and it was from uh, multi-state nursing licensure compact. The costs and benefits for Vermont from the Secretary of State's office. And that's where it shows the increase in fees. And but and just so you know that that I looked at it again, and um, we haven't. I have not had an opportunity to reach out to Lauren Hibbert at the Secretary of State's office. But that um, just because that is listed as a fee increase, that not indicative of what actually may happen. So I just want to be clear on that. That's maybe somewhat out of context, but I would like uh, Senator Hardy, you've been, you did a great job uh, presenting the bill yesterday and responded to Josh's concerns uh, through your email. And I guess I would ask you to, um, if you can, just to share your thoughts on this proposal of amendment. Um, I will say up front, I'm, I am a little bit concerned about um, telling an, uh, the any part of the administration or executive branch 
that they can't raise fees for a specific reason then and it and just so you know also josh this amendment would affect finance and so it may be a finance consideration before the bill can be uh, go through third reading so just just fyi on that one so um but go ahead uh senator hardy go ahead um, sure. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, well, I can just repeat a little bit of what I responded last night to Senator Terenzini as the reporter of the bill. And um, he was concerned that we hadn't talked about this issue in, in committee. Um, but we did get testimony on it from a number of people, including Lauren Hibbert from the Office of Professional Regulation. And it's also included in the fiscal note that um, Nolan Langweil did for the bill. Um, it is... Um, at this point, uh, an estimate, um, it's not a known um, amount of a fee increase. And I think the report that Josh is, or I'm sorry, Senator Terenzini is referencing, um, was trying to do a best guess estimate. Um, and that was also two years ago. Um, it is, uh, as professional Office of Professional Regulation has testified, it is, th they would attempt to mitigate as much as possible through um, reductions in expenses at the nurse licensing board, um, but they do anticipate that there would likely be some fee increase. However, all fees are um, must be approved by the legislature, so the legislature would have uh, the ability to adjust those fees um, through a fee bill or a separate bill regarding the fees of the nurses. Um, I share your concern, Senator Lyons. I think this is an amendment that needs to go to finance. And since Senator Cummings isn't here, I will speak for um, her if, if I may, um, and just say that I, I think because this would um, impact um, the revenues of the state, um, finance would need to see it. I, and I don't know, um, I see Katie is the only ledge council person we have on um, the call, but um, I think it also um, binds a future legislature um, potentially, and that isn't in terms of what they can or can't do um, with um, fees. And so I'm not sure that that is um, kosher. <laughs> yeah, no, it certainly, it certainly, it certainly it binds the OPR. And then, yeah, so I'm not yeah, sure. So, I don't know if Katie, yeah. if you, I know this isn't your bill or your area, but if you, I don't know if you've seen this amendment, but if it's something that it looks to me like it would potentially bind a future legislature on what they could or couldn't do for, for um, raising revenue. I haven't staffed the bill and I'm not familiar with the end amendment. So I, okay. I don't feel comfortable <laughs> weighing in and giving you an opinion. You're the only lawyer on the call. So I, I needed to ask you, but in, in any case, I think this is something that um, finance needs to look at and weigh in on this afternoon. Um, but as it's written, I would not be supportive of this amendment. Um, I, I'm definitely sympathetic to the, the concerns of your constituents and um, other nurses who are concerned about um, fees being raised. Um, as I said to you in my email, I, the Office of Public, uh, Office of Professional Regulation originally opposed the bill in part because of this reason, but came around to supporting it because of the benefits to the profession. And that's pretty much where I am too. I think the broader benefits to the profession outweigh the potential for a fee increase. Well, okay. I, uh, go ahead, I'm Senator sorry. Terenzini, go ahead. I appreciate, I appreciate your comments and your thoughts, Senator Hardy. Uh, to me, um, it, is no, it is no fault of any Vermont licensed nurse that we have a nursing shortage. And for me to sit here and, and say, well, we need more nurses. We're going to come up with the nurse compact bill, but guess what? Now we're going to now we're going to put the co the increased costs on the backs of our nurses is is really troubling to me. Uh, and yes, we're talking a hundred dollars every two years. We're talking fifty dollars a year. But our nurses work very hard, and many would say that they're not compensated enough. And now for me to say, hey, we're going to pass a bill that brings more nurses here, makes it easier for nurses to come in to help us, but yet you need to offset some of the lost revenue to this office of professional regulation. It's, it's really troubling to me. And so I appreciate that you're, you're, you're not looking to support this amendment. Um, I respect that, but I, I don't know how I could support this bill on the house floor for third reading, knowing that I'm going to cost money to current registered nurses who have dedicated 
their lives to their craft and say, you guys need to pay more because an office that takes in millions and millions of dollars every year is going to lose some revenue. So I want to give everyone an opportunity to respond to this, but I, I will say that the, the uh, amendment do, doesn't really, it does bind the legislature indirectly. It, it binds the Office of Pro Professional Regulation from not recommending or increasing the license renewal fee. It, it's not clear to me that the Finance Committee couldn't um, make changes to that. It doesn't say anything about what the legislature can or cannot do in that uh, proposal amendment. So, Senator Lyons, uh, is it an option to um, ask uh, to hold off on third reading today and ask finance to look at my amendment? Uh, let's let's hold that. Let's hold that for a minute. That may well be where we get to, Senator Terenzini. So, um, and we might do that. The Senator Hooker, did you want to add any comments? I'm just saying, you know, it's another one of those situations where the people who are doing the work are being sort of penalized. And yet, as Senator Hardy said, for the overall good, it seems as if this is in the route that we should be taking. Um, and I, I have to defer to OPR uh, and their um, comments that they'll do what they can to mitigate the increase. You know, so I would say that, you know, if we want to have finance, take a look at it and see if there's another way to, to affect this, that's fine. Um, but right now, I, I don't think I would want to see the amendment go as it's written. Okay, um, thank you. And, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this since Josh and I talked last night, and I very much appreciated Senator Hardy's uh, response and uh, diving into the testimony that was taken that OPR is very uh, is also concerned about this because any barrier that we put up for nurses, whether it's a fifty dollar per year increase or other, um, it, it, it could result in the opposite of what we would hope from the bill. So, however, I do think OPR is very sensitive to this, and I and I know that um, uh, when when we the first time. The bill was taken up. It was at Girl State in the summer and uh, OPR came in. Uh, I was working with some of the kids and OPR came in categorically against the proposal and then have since modified their position. And I think in part because they understand the ability to um, make some efficiencies within their area, within their office. And so I would, I would not at this time support this proposal of amendment as it's written. I am very supportive of our nurses and very sympathetic to not wanting the million dollars to be covered by uh, fees for L LPNs or RNs. Uh, but I do think that it may end up being a, a part of the puzzle. So um, Josh, with due respect, I think that I can't um, also support uh, the proposal at this time. And Senator Hardy, you wanted to speak. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add, uh, there are other options if, if OPR does come in with a fee increase request um, that the legislature could take, for example, um, funding um, the, the difference with general fund is always an option if we have general fund available. Um, and if uh, we have an increase in the number of Vermont nurses who are applying for the Vermont license, um, then the increase in the number of nurses could offset the revenue loss also, um, which is what I think we all hope for. We want to see that 5,000 nurse shortage be filled. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would also say with 34 other states in this compact, if Vermont does not join the compact, I think it does put us at a disadvantage, especially as a very, very small state in the whole scheme of the national nursing um, profession. So that is another reason why, um, even though I share the concerns about the increase in fees, 
um, that I would support it. And, and finally, there are other proposals on the table to sort of address the nursing shortage, as I said in my bill report yesterday, this is just one tool in the toolbox. This is certainly not going to solve the nursing shortage and nobody thinks that's true. Um, but there are other proposals on the table that would benefit nurses individually, financially, such as a tax, um, tax credit. Um, and also there are employers who pay the nurse fee for nurses um, in order to attract um, them to a position. So there are other options on the table for this. So just wanted to say that too. Okay. Thanks. So I think um, Josh, you're hearing, uh, it, you know, I think you're hearing a lot of support for the motivation for what is in the uh, proposal of amendment but not support for the amendment as written. And um, so you wanted to make one more, make one more comment, but then I think we should move on. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for, for my colleagues on the committee. I hope you all know that, but I, I feel like uh, um, I may have to go out, I may have to do this on my own um, uh, because I have really strong convictions about this and it, and it really just doesn't settle well with me for what I, my previous comments. Um, I appreciate your opinion, but I also know it's probably not um, customary to go against your committee on the Senate floor with an amendment, but I, I just feel so strongly Senator Lyons about this that I, at, I, it might not go anywhere, but at least I know tonight when I go to bed that I feel like I did what I need to do. You're, you're, you have every right to take this proposal to the floor of the Senate and present it. I will say that given the, um, the, the, what I would consider the straw poll that we have before us, which is three to one, that I would ask Senator Hardy to represent the committee's position on this. And then uh, we'll see what happens from there, whether, whether it is, um, whether there's a Passover and it goes to finance or whether it is voted on, uh, on the floor, that, that'll be part of the process. I, I'll, I will check in with uh, Senator Ballant so that we are all on the same page with this and it may be, uh, we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll consider process uh, later. So, but you, ha you can go, oh, go ahead with your uh, proposal of amendment. No one's telling you cannot do that. We're simply saying it's not supported by the committee at this time. Understood, thank you. All right, terrific. Okay, so let's, um, let's move on to S91. Nellie, I see that Senator Westman has not appeared. So Senator Hardy, you're also a sponsor on the bill. Did you wanna say a few words about the Parent Child Center Network bill? I know that um, Senator Hooker was not on the committee last year, nor was Senator Terenzini, so it might be helpful just to hear your uh, 20,000 foot or the support of the bill. We'll be glad to hear that. Sure, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this bill is S91. And it is a bill uh, or a version of a bill that has um, been introduced and supported before by this committee. Um, it is a bill that Senator Westman has championed for a, at least a couple of years. Um, and um, it would um, update the statutes that oversee the um, governance and um, administration of parent child centers in the state of Vermont. Um, and, uh, how they are appropriated funding, how they are, how the funding is determined, um, the criteria for becoming a parent child center, and the accountability um, within the uh, parent child center network. Um, so I won't go through all the details of the bill because I think Tyler's going to do that. Um, but uh, as you all know, um, there is a network of parent child centers that um, exist in most of our districts, and they serve some of the neediest, um, most vulnerable children and young parents in our districts. Um, they are a national model. The first um, Parent Child Center, I believe, um, and Amy can correct me if I'm wrong, was started, I believe, in the late 70s, early 80s in, in um, Vermont and has become a national model. I know some of the women who helped start it, and it is a, a, a fabulous model for supporting 
young families with wraparound services, housing um, support, um, childcare, parenting skills, nutrition, et cetera. And um, it's, it's, it's a win-win and a really great effective um, program. And I hope that we can support updating their statutes and providing additional funding for these important um, services in our communities. Thank you, that was, that was great. And I, I know that establishing some standards across the state for parent-child centers through the network is something that we did talk a, a great deal about and find it to be important as well as linking in with the services that you've mentioned as well as perhaps some primary care. So um, I'm gonna turn to Tyler and ask Tyler if, if you would please give us, um, not a not a real detailed review of the bill, but it's kind of, so so we understand what each section represents, and then after we've done that, we'll we'll turn to Amy um, and we'll be asking questions. So why don't we go through the bill? All right, thank, thank you, you, Chair. I appreciate it. Now I would like to thank the chair and the committee for letting me conduct my first uh, walkthrough with them. Uh, one moment, I've lost my notes. You're good. You got it. There we go. All right. So uh, I'm Tyler Kirkpatrick. Uh, I'm a student clinician with uh, from Vermont uh, Law School, and I'll be walking you through S91, an act relating to uh, the Parent Child Center Network. Uh, as, we, as the committee mentioned before, uh, some of you have probably seen this bill uh, it was passed by House Health Care last bi biennium. However, it did not make it past the Senate. Uh, next, I'll turn to the language of the bill. Uh, the purpose of the bill is uh, to establish a parent-child center network to ensure accountability among and distribute funding to the parent-child centers, uh, amend the criteria for the designation uh, for designation as a parent-child center. Uh, appropriate base funding to the Parent Child Center Network, and finally establish an annual inflation factor for monies appropriated to the uh, Parent Child Center Network. And then moving on down to the title, uh, the title is changed because there is a change uh, from it as a program to a network. So you'll see that the change uh, takes it from the Parent Child Center Program to the Parent Child Center Network. And then moving on down uh, in section one, you'll see that the parent child centers uh, definition has been refined here uh, without specific instances of, um, of uh, like medically, socially, or educationally at risk and defining the uh, children and parents that they uh, um, serve. Uh, so this, this is a little bit more broader definition. And then, um, Scrolling on down, you'll see in section B, uh, this removes the language for the Secretary of Human Service, uh, excuse me, services to award grants to the qualifying centers and replaces it with the new designation process for the Parent Child Centers Network. Uh, the Parent Child Center Network, uh, under this language, Parent Child Center Network may recommend to the Secretary of Human Services one or more new parent child centers for designation every six years. At that point, the secretary will review the center and make sure it fits the criteria uh, within this bill. Moving down to section C, uh, this stipulates the eligibility requirements for the designation of a parent child center, which is what the secretary of human services would look like. Um, this is, uh, most of this is language that is already established. However, there are four new stipulations, let's see. The first is complete a peer review every three years, which uh, shall be conducted by the Parent Child Center Network. Uh, uh, provide uh, each of the eight course services that will go on in subsection, go over in subsection D. Um, indicate an intention to participate in the Parent Child uh, Center Network as a member and work to achieve uh, population level quality of care outcomes related to the children's and families pursuant to 3 VSA subsection 2311. Um, scrolling on down, 
we have uh, sub, let's see, section D, uh, this removes service requirements uh, associated with the old grant process and establishes the eight core services uh, for parent child center. Uh, those are home visits, early childhood services, parent education, play groups, parent support groups, uh, concrete supports, community uh, development and resources and referrals. Finally, if we'll scroll on down at the top of the page, um, you'll see that there is a uh, les legacy designation for parent-child centers that are already established. So if, if, there are, if there is currently a parent-child center under the program, they'll be uh, established under the network if this bill passes. And then moving on down to funding and section A, this requires the Secretary of Human Service, uh, Services to disperse a joint appropriation for all parent child center services to the parent child center network, which will distri distribute the funding to each parent child center. Also, any increases, increases to the base funding will be based on community need, provision of additional services, and designation of a new parent child center. Moving on to section B, uh, this requires that the parent child center network uh, to work with the agency of human services to develop and measure to develop and measure accountability and provide program information that will be useful for the secretary to evaluate the services provided by the granted funds, the effect of services on uh, consumers, and accounting uh, the expenditure of grant funds. Moving on to subsection C, uh, this is the uh, section that provides for an annual inflation, inflation adjustment for the Parent Child Center Network Appropriation. And then after that, in Section 3, we have the effective date of July 1, 2021. And that'll conclude the walkthrough. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you, Tyler. That was absolutely perfect. We got it. Great. Thank you, Chair. And the law school is doing a good job. And so is our ledge counsel, Katie McClinn. Appreciate it very much. So uh, as you're going through um, there, of course, I think we probably all have a bunch of questions that um, we're going to have to ask of uh, the secretary uh, and as well as the Parent Child Center Network folks. Um, the, it's interesting to me that the funding model that is in the bill, and Amy, I'm gonna ask you to correct me if I'm uh, way off base, but it seems like the funding model that's there uh, is similar to what we had during the pandemic with the stabilization uh, monies available to parent child centers where the distribution was through the PCCs themselves. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Amy Schollenberger for the record. I represent the parent child center network as a lobbyist. Um, so that was the request for the CRF money and it kind of worked like that. So the, um, the agency did, and department did work very closely with the parent child centers to the network to figure out how to distribute the funds, but it didn't actually flow through the network. It, it was separate checks directly from the department is my understanding, but it was getting closer to the model um, that the network is really looking for. And the request here is really for the network to be um, a structure that's recognized uh, and codified and seen as a direct partner with the department um, in order to provide these services. All right, thank you. Um, I actually, Tyler, have a question about three uh, VS VSA 2311, and that's a section it's in, <clears throat> looks like it might be a reporting process or is it administrative process? Let me see. Uh, I think it's around the, the area of the criteria. There it is, it's on page four. Work to achieve population level quality of life outcomes related to children and families pursuant to three VSA 2311. So this is uh, practically, uh, it's, like you said, Chair, a reporting service to make sure 
that uh, any of the programs that reference this particular statute um, are uh, meeting certain criteria. Um, in 2311, there are several stipulations as far as uh, quality of life um, and anything that could apply to that. So ensuring that Vermonters are healthy, uh, clean environment, safe place to live. Um, so when, it's, when the bill is referencing that particular portion, it expects that uh, the parent-child center network and the, the centers themselves will uh, meet this particular um, level of, of uh, reporting and also effectability in the services they provide. Is that, um, is that, is that to the, a specific department as it go to the Department of Health or? I'm not trying to confuse, I'm not trying to pin you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> confuse you in any way. I, I really wanted to understand what it meant. And I see, we'll go to Katie, well, you had- Yeah, your, before I speak out of place, yeah. let's ask Katie. Oh, no, it's good, it's helpful. Uh, it just, it stood out to me as, as something that might be critical to a link with our population-based health analysis. So the language that's cross-referenced there is what we're kind of more commonly referring to as the state outcomes report. And this was adopted a few years ago, but I think maybe the phrasing state outcomes report might be a little bit more familiar to members. Yeah. Um, and this was the list of all of the um, population level quality of life outcomes that um, were used to measure how effective programs and state government are. In terms of who is doing it, it's the chief performance officer within the agency of the administration. And it's coming uh, to the General Assembly annually on September 30th. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that brings back memories. Um, uh, so a Amy, you wanted to comment on this, that would be helpful. Yeah, I think I might be able to clarify a little bit. So uh, sometimes these are referred to as your results-based accountability measures in state statute. And already the parent-child centers identify uh, which population level outcomes they're working towards. And they also have objectives underneath them for the department to achieve through their master grant funding. And this just uh, states plainly in statute if you pass it, that that would be the continuation that it's sort of part of the accountability process that the network really wanted to set up with the department to show that they are working to achieve the outcomes that the state has identified as important. And the reason we suggest it, um, phrasing it this way, instead of naming the outcomes is because sometimes, you know, you all decide to change what's important to you um, or how you say it. And so we thought it would be better if we tagged it to the statute rather than you know, writing them out specifically. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I do have another question that maybe you could answer. Um, so the, um, and, and I don't know, maybe this is just a discussion the committee will have at some point, but it seems to me that as we're looking at a health improvement plan within the Department of Health, parent-child centers may be integral to that, uh, that plan for population health improvement. So I'll just put that out there and maybe as we go through the bill, that's something we could uh, have, have a dis discussion about. Um, and, and then the other one was, um, cause I haven't memorized the bill yet, is the, um, Katie or, or Tyler, is there anything here on, or Amy, social determinants of health? I don't believe so, Chair. I don't see any okay. sp particular um, outlines for that or requirements. Okay. Amy or... Go um, ahead. So I'm happy to answer that, but I, I saw Senator Hardy had her hand up. I don't want to jump in front of her. <laughs> I did not see your hand up, Senator. Go ahead. That, that's okay. You were you were looking down. We all do. <laughs> um, all right. I, uh, well, I was just going to, I don't know if Katie did this, but I was going to read the population quality life outcomes because they also are some somewhat um, uh, d social determinants of health in some, uh, some of them are um, related to it. And it's 
great. How many are there? How there long are 10. There are 10. They're short. <laughs> okay. Um, and they're really interesting, actually. Vermont has a prosperous economy. Vermont Vermonters are healthy. Vermont's environment is clean and sustainable. Vermont is a safe place to live. Vermont's families are safe, nurturing, stable, and supported. Vermont's children and young people achieve their potential. Uh, Vermont's elders live with dignity in settings they prefer. Vermonters with disabilities live with dignity in settings they prefer. Vermont has open, effective, and inclusive government, and Vermont's state infrastructure meets the needs of Vermonters, the economy, and the environment. So that's a pretty good list, but you're right, Amy, we might, you know, change it every once in a while. So um, that. Okay. I, I think some of those are sort of related to social determinants of health, but we could certainly add more in to the bill directly. So, yeah, that uh, I I would think we'd at least want to discuss that. Um, Amy, did you want to comment? Yes, yeah, so if I could just add. Um, so, uh, the the parent child centers are of course focused on the social determinants of health. And although it's not referenced, I don't believe specifically in the bill, um, the eight core services being codified as a key component of that, um, as well as I think the committee is familiar with the PCC work, they do um, focus on the protective factors, the five protective factors uh, through the strengthening families framework. And that also leads uh, strongly to the social determinants of health. So I'm sure the directors can fill you in a lot more on that, uh, but certainly they are, they're all in uh, on that for families. Okay, uh, you know, it might be worthwhile just thinking about how to link it in. I know that in the past you've had some excellent uh, graphics relating to the pyramid for health and um, sort of mitigating the some of the social determinants so or at least addressing those well maybe that's a place we can look um in conjunction with 3 vsa 2311 we'll have to just sort of sort that out i don't we don't want to step on the toes of the national network or the standards that are in place at all but knowing that the importance of what the work that's going on in our state with PCCs, we want to reinforce that. All right, anything else committee? Senator Hooker? Um, it's a good bill. Uh, it's my first <laughs> time talking about it. So I think I have a lot to learn about it. And I'm glad that Amy and Katie and Tyler are here to help us. And certainly Senator Hardy, because she's worked really hard on this. And Senator Terenzini, any questions? Not at this time, Senator Lyons. Thanks for the okay. presentation. Okay. Tyler, is there anything that we're missing as we're going through this? Do you, have you, when you've gone through the bill, um, do you see anything problematic in the, in the bill itself from a, 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 a legislative council perspective? Uh, no, ma'am. It seems uh, fairly straightforward. It has uh, requirements for the new network. It has funding, uh, which are the, with my limited experience, those are the two things I always look at, uh, especially with funding. So, and that's laid out um, in the bill. So I don't really see anything that uh, it would need or it's missing or would be catching. Okay, thank you. I think one of the, I know that the, uh, one of the parent and child centers that I'm very familiar with um, is the, uh, the Janet Munt family room in Burlington. And, um, some terrific folks down there, but it's also very much a place where uh, new Americans are situated. And so I, I'm wondering if there was any consideration as the bill was drafted about um, issues around equity and, and building a community through equitable uh, assessment and treatment of, of folks. Uh, so that's a that's just a question that perhaps we'd like to explore. I'm also very familiar with that that center and then uh, that the um, the center in Lamoille County that um, where we spent some time visiting 
um, that, that has integrated or has integrated itself into the primary care uh, program. So that's the, that's the other question. I see, I, I know that there is, there's primary, the word primary is in there. And Amy, I'll just sort of ask you any, is the goal to work toward um, having primary care services or will that be something that we'd be, that would be, we would welcome but wouldn't expect? Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand that part of the question, but uh, one thing I can tell you is that there is a whole section around equity in the national standards, so that is addressed in the statute. Um, and just so I don't forget, I wanted to let the committee know I sent a bill summary to Nellie, and I believe she's posted it on your website, so you have that handy. Do you want to go uh, through it with us? Um, I, I think it doesn't, it's no more than what Tyler and Senator Hardy did, but I just wanted to let you know it was there as a reference. In terms of primary care, I, I know that um, many of the parent child centers are um, connecting with pediatricians offices. Five of them have um, Dulce or a Dulce like program. And I know um, everyone is working uh, you know, to make sure that families are connected to healthcare for sure. It's one of the key things that um, it's part of the resource and referral part of the eight core services um, to make sure that families are getting connected to all of the services that they need. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, so we'll, as we go through the bill, um, we'll have to learn more about the specifics of the national standards and, and what the implications of that. But knowing the interest that this legislature has in equity issues, we may want to um, highlight that or have that in the bill in some way. And I, I mean, my own interest is in the link with pediatric and primary care offices. So I don't know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna make this a 20 page bill, but. <laughs> We certainly want to recognize the good work that's going on. I think that's the point. Senator Hardy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I was wondering, Amy, if you could send us the national standards um, or a link to them or something that might be helpful. Um, and I was just looking through um, some questions I got from colleagues um, that um, we, and, and questions I had um, for Amy before, um, as I was working on the bill about, um, the redesignation process and the sort of six year cycle and how um, that works. And then obviously we'll wanna hear from AHS and um, because this changes their role in relationship with the parent child centers. And then one of our colleagues asked me about um, visitation, I believe, Amy, do you remember specifically, but it was, it was about um, how parent child centers work with- um, uh, Home visit? Uh, no, with, uh, you know, when one parent needs to have a supervised visitation with a child um, and whether or not they do those services and if they do, how they do them. Um, that I, it's a very specific question, but one of our colleagues asked me and I didn't know the answer. <laughs> um, so, and it, it's, I'm a real bummed that we can't go visit parent child centers because I know mine, the one in Middlebury very, very well, but I've, I've never visited any others and it would be wonderful if we could do a field trip. <laughs> Well, I think that's a great idea. Um, we did, I did uh, in the, um, the working group that we had on um, social determinants, ACEs, we did visit uh, Brattleboro, uh, Lamoille, uh, maybe Burlington, I'm trying to remember, but it, that's, a, that's a really, I was gonna actually suggest that if you each can visit your, um, your local, that would be great. Um, we'll just see, given where we are right now with the masking, social distancing and other issues, um, that that's a good um, aspirational goal <laughs> to, to take a field trip and visit uh, these, these folks, be good. Go ahead, Senator Hooker. We have a great parent child center in Rutland that suffered some serious damage a few years ago and has really risen out of the ashes as it were, or the water as 
case <laughs> over, actually, um, and is now working on an expansion that is um, you know, that will be a real model for all, for parent child center. So I'm hoping that we can have them into talk about what's happening. There. So I I think that's a great idea, and um, what I'm going to suggest is that there are a lot of very uh, specific questions that we have and we want to hear from parent child centers. Uh, we do want to hear from the agency, the secretary and others um, on on all of this. And so uh, I, I think as a, as a start, Senator Hardy, you could uh, draft up a list of folks. And then as we find time to take testimony on this bill, we'll, we'll put that in, into place. That would be extremely helpful. Um, and I, I bet I bet Amy would be willing to help with that. And, yeah, uh, Amy, I'll work with you on the list. <laughs> That'd Absolutely. be super. Whatever you need. Thank you. Um, and so, Senator Hooker. Just one other thought. Um, all of the, aid, the programs that are in existence now will come under this network, correct? Yeah. And so, and they're all at sort of different levels. And I'm just um, wanting to make sure that the the programs that need assistance in kind of moving into this broader um, coalition or group network. will have the network will have that kind of assistance. So I guess that comes under funding. So all, all 15 PCCs are currently members of the network as it exists now. And it, my understanding is they've all been now trained in the national standards and they're all working towards implementing those standards at their parent child centers with support from the national group. So I don't, I'm not sure if that addresses your full question, but. Well, just to make sure that resources are not an issue for the either smaller parent child centers or ones that need more help in uh, coming up to standards. I think so, that's the appropriations part of the bill. Yeah. Right. That, that, that's the sticky wicket. Um, we know that. And then the, the COLA that you've got in there, um, that, that's another place. And I know that I can't, all of our social service agencies uh, and specialized service agencies and others. Uh, and as we go through the child care bill, we're going to see a request for um, some kind of a CPI or increase over time. So the, that, that'll be a, an ongoing conversation. Um, and it'll be a balanced, uh, it's gonna be balanced ultimately in appropriations and it's going to depend very much on the priorities that we set in this committee. So that is one good reason for us to get uh, started on the bill. I know it's an S bill, but um, it fits in with so much of the other work that we're doing that um, I think it's important for us to take it up now. How it, how it gets passed, we'll find out, um, but I think, it is, uh, I think it's pretty important. Go ahead, Senator Hardy. Yeah, just one more thing. I'm just trying to think of all the things people have told me related to the bill. Um, the other issue that I think may come up in the context of the budget, but is certainly relevant, um, is um, apparently there's some concerns about some some things the House has done with transportation related to parent-child centers. Um, and I've heard some concerns out there about how that may impact um, the centers and their, their clients. So um, we'll want to keep an eye on that. And um, Good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very definitely. All right. Um, so we have a lot of work to do on the bill. First, to understand everything that's in it and, and why some things are in and some things are out. And then what we might do to link it with uh, some of the work that we've done in the past. And then, and then the heavy lift, all the money. So, uh, it is part of, uh, so Amy, off the top of your head right now, what has, was the appropriation in the, uh, not the, not the CRF funding, but in our ordinary everyday budget, do you have a sense of what that appropriation has been in the past, like 2019? Yes. 
Yeah. So the governor's recommend uh, for this coming fiscal year is level funded at $3.3 million. Okay. Um, and the request in the bill is to increase funding to $7.5 million. The parent child center's estimate of the actual fair price for their services is $10 million. That's been our request for a while. So this would move us much closer to that and give a stronger foundation for the work. Okay. And they, the, the funding for this goes directly to the center rather than to uh, a parent. It's not like a CCFAP or, or other uh, appropriation to an individual. It is directly to the center. This, yeah, the funding is a line item in the budget that funds a grant that runs through the Department for Children and Families to the 15 parent child centers. However, part of the grant covers one of the eCore services, which is concrete supports, which does actually help the Parents. PCCs to purchase things that families might need or help them repair their car or something like that. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, so as we go through this, it would be helpful to have a breakout of that information. We're not the appropriations committee, but it's important for us to understand what might be left in and left out and what our recommendations can be uh, to appropriations. Okay, any other questions for Tyler? Any other questions for Amy? I think, well, I have a lot of questions, but I'm, <laughs> we all have questions, <laughs> but just, just in, in terms of basic uh, understanding, I think we're good and we'll, we'll ask, We'll, we'll look for a list of folks to testify and then um, do what we can do for the bill. And then we'll sort out how, if, and when uh, we, we take it up again. So there are no promises here because we are in the uh, after crossover and we've got a huge amount of other work to do. But um, I think uh, this has always been a priority for me and I'm really glad that we have the bill. So we'll try to, um, we'll try to move it along. Tyler, it's absolutely great to have you here. And um, we have some work ahead of us on the bill and look forward to working with you on that. Thank you so much, Chair. I really appreciate you having All me right. here today. Terrific. Okay. So we have seven minutes before 10 o'clock. And what I'm going to suggest is that we take a seven minute stretch, the seventh inning stretch. Okay. So just, uh, Nellie, we're just going to take a seven minute break and then we will be back. And, and Amy, uh, can't thank you enough. This is uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Senator Hardy for sponsoring the bill. We yes. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. So Thanks, we're Tyler.